it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, for those of you who were here earlier and heard uh, Steve Margolin talking about um, his travails with the economics department, um, I, I wanted to mention that I've also had um, a similar history of that. I came to Harvard. I am an economist, although I am now teaching in a department of sociology, um, which can be explained in part by what economics became over um, the years, particularly in the uh, 1990s um, and later 80s. But um, I came here in 1984, and one of the uh, first things that happened was I got embroiled in a conflict about Ec-10 uh, because I at, was hired as a radical economist, and I was supposed to be able to teach a section of of ra the radical section, which meant I would do what Professor Marglin's course now does. That is, I'd teach the regular material, and we'd have extra sessions, and I'd teach the critique. And the person who took over the course at that, uh, in that year, uh, Martin Feldstein, um, canceled the radical sections. And that led to a year-long fight with students uh, and a group of faculty. We were small. And we had about the same vote that you know Steve had I don't know, 20 years later, uh, when he was trying to get his course through. So that, um, and I was very involved in the living wage uh, struggle here. And so it's really fantastic to see the Occupy movement so vibrant at Harvard. And I felt very proud that Harvard was among, you know, on, on the day the, the occupation started here, where there was the first. Um, the, the first days of co uh, university occupation. So um, congratulations to all of you, and thank you for all the fantastic work you're doing. Um, the title of my talk is Economics for the 99%. And I, do, I, I thought I would focus on a couple of ways in which economics for the 99% is different from the kind of economics that dominates the profession today. And I'm going to talk mainly about two things. One is the issue of distribution, again, something Professor Marglin raised. And the other is uh, the question of the environment or the ecology. Um, and, and I think they're both really important. Um, I should say before I start that um, I came into economics in the 1970s, which was a time like this, um, when economics was under attack. Uh, from a more radical movement, which was unhappy about what it was doing. Of course, there was a large uh, political movement that was um, attacking you know, many, uh, many disciplines, uh, not so heavily focused in economics as, as we have today. Um, one of the things that happened was many of the other fields that came under attack in the 60s and 70s for their conservatism, their narrowness, their failure to be relevant, and many of the same kinds of critiques that we hear today from the Occupy movement, those professions change dramatically. So if we think about history, sociology, anthropology, the humanities, they were very profoundly influenced by the, the movement that came up in the 60s and 70s. And the, um, you know, many of the students who um, were active in those movements went into fields and changed those disciplines. Economics went in the other direction. It got more conservative. And that didn't happen right away in the 70s, but there was already that uh, counter-revolution uh, rising. You may have read the, the piece on Tom Sargent, which was very interesting. Uh, this year's um, prize winner in uh, economics, prize winner Nobel. Um, uh, who what, he was one of the sort of leaders of that counter-revolution, the so-called rational expectations revolution. But the discipline got more and more conservative over the 80s and the 90s and into the 2000s. And the reason for that, I think, is not uh, anything rooted primarily in uh, sort of intellectual dynamics. Uh, but because economics is a highly political discipline that tends to move with the larger politics. And as the politics in the country moved to the right, the discipline moved to the right. When I got into economics, it was uh, 
really, I think, best characterized as a pretty liberal discipline. People who wanted to make the world a better place and thought the government was an important instrument for doing that. So modern liberals dominated very much in the profession because that was the dominant political um, force of the day. So uh, I, I believe that if the Occupy movement is, is able to grow and thrive and increase and really change the political trend in this country on, a, on, a, on an ongoing basis. Clearly, it's already had an amazing impact, very transformative impact of, on the discourse of this country in economic terms. If you remember, in the summer, all we were talking about was the deficit. And now we're talking about economic inequality and distribution of power and the financial system and the role that it's playing. It's completely transformed the discourse. If we are able to keep this going, the economics profession will change too. And the kinds of ideas that we're talking about here today will, will again come to be really important ideas. So um, what are the two? Uh, <laughs> so what are the, the two key points of difference that I want to talk about? Well, the first one is distribution. Now, distribution is at the core of what Occupy is thinking about. And it's, it's taken its framing as the distribution of income and wealth, the one and the 99, and that um, in, incredible, rapid, unprecedented, historical concentration of wealth and income that has occurred in this country and around the world in the last um, 30 years, roughly, and particularly in the last 10 years, and then since the crisis, the fact that uh, rather than a reversal of that inequality, which is what all of us expected when the crisis happened, those big banks and that shadow banking system and um, the uh, elites of the 1% have been able to use this crisis to actually increase their power and increase the concentrations of wealth. So that's, that's pretty stunning. And that has to do with the fact that there wasn't a political opposition uh, after the downturn until now. So mainstream economics has as one of its most important and sort of core gut intellectual commitments the idea that distribution is secondary, that distribution we think about afterwards, or that distribution we may even be silent on. P Professor Marglin noted the, the, uh, that, that what he called an ideological commitment to efficiency. And that's the sort of guise or the, the justification for not thinking about distribution. So for example, in the standard model, and I don't know how much this comes out in the, in the introductory teaching, but certainly at a graduate level where you're dealing with a formal model, which is kind of this is the official story um, sort of uh, way of teaching. Either there is, there is no assumption about the distribution of assets or the distribution of income it, that comes into the market, or there's some uh, fictional assumption made about what it is. But generally speaking, uh, what the, what the, the uh, field does is worry about efficiency, that is, what the, mo the most efficient outcome in the market, and then says, we can worry about the distribution later. So we think about it ex post. So it's not, a, it's not an uh, input variable into the system. It's something that gets uh, comes out, so it's an endogenous rather than exogenous variable for those of you who know that language. So one of the things that this means is that an economic, uh, in terms of economic outcomes, the theory has no way of saying anything about the relative merits of a distribution in which 1% have as much as the 99% in which 25% have as much as the 75, in which it's a 50-50. It doesn't have a language. It doesn't have a way of talking about that, a way of saying that it's better to have a distribution that is broader than a distribution that is uh, highly concentrated. In fact, in a lot of the models, it doesn't really matter. 
all that matters is the efficiency gains from a market process, and then they say, well, because we could always just take those gains and redistribute them ex post. So the ex ante, that is the before the thing happens, before the model is run, as it were, distribution, uh, we're silent on that, and then uh, don't worry, we'll just make the necessary changes. Whatever the market yields, if we don't like it, we can make the changes. Now, second really important point that Occupy has made, uh, duh, we can't make the changes. Why? The 1% now owns the government, which we need to make the ex post changes. And the whole model of social democracy, which is don't worry about bad market outcomes, we'll use the state to ameliorate them, we'll use uh, fiscal policy to make the distribution of income better and so forth. That whole model has now fallen apart when you have a state that can't act in the interest of the 99% because it's so beholden to the 1% or to the economic system that rewards the 1%. So the post-war uh, system, social democracy or whatever, we never had that in the United States, but the social contract, uh, Obama was just talking about the social contract this week. That's what the social contract really has been, and that is now failing. So why, uh, we might want to ask the question, well, why is it that economists uh, take this stance? Um, and this long predated, you know, what I would, I think is not an exaggeration to call the corruption of the profession by uh, financial interests by the corporatization of the profession, the, the uh, strong uh, interrelationships between economics, professionals, professors, including many people here at this university, and financial institutions particularly, but the corporate sector more generally. They're getting large sums of money, as you know, I'm, I'm sure many people know. Um, I have a student who was working on this back in the 1980s, in fact, looking at those boards of directors that people were sitting, uh, that, that uh, the ec economists here were sitting on, and the, the, um, the uh, financial ties with the corporate sector between the profession. But this commitment to efficiency versus distribution came long before those ties were there. And it actually came about uh, at another time of great sort of moral conflict around economics issues in the 19th century with the rise of neoclassical economics out of classical economics. In classical economics, distribution was absolutely fundamental. It was the, the first variable, in a sense, that the classical economists looked at, and it was crucial in, in answering questions like how fast does the economy grow? What's the path of the economy? How much consumption versus investment do we have? And whether we're talking about Smith, Ricardo, or Marx, the three you know, most prominent classical economists, the distribution between the split between wages and profits or between workers and owners, that split was the, probably the most important piece of information that they asked about the economy to understand how it operated. And what it meant was if workers got a lot, they consumed, and so the growth, there was less investment. If capitalists got a lot of profits, they invested it. This was in the days, you know, it was a, a much simpler economy in those days and so forth. But um, the, the, that, that was a sort of common assumption. And Keynes, although he wasn't a classical economist, also took the view that the way income is distributed will have profound impacts on economic outcomes. And what he was most concerned about was whether the economy would be fully employed or whether would we, we would be in depression or recession. And uh, key insight of Keynes was if you give more money to, to lower income people, they will spend it and that will do more to the economy than if you give it to higher income people who have a lower propensity to spend and will not invest unless they see the demand uh, forthcoming. And that's, of course, the, the problem that we're in at the moment, which is the uh, investors, corporations, wealthy individuals, and so forth are sitting on enormous trillions of cash, the largest hoard of cash in all of human history, and they're not investing it 
because they don't see the demand. The anticipated demand isn't there. So Keynes's model also said you have to look at the distribution, and when you take a lot of money away from the people at the bottom, you can very well get stuck in a trap, as a, a depression, a long-term depression or long-term stagnation, such as the one we're in today, because you have weak conditions for demand. Um, now, that actually brings me to another, my second point, which is about the environment or the planetary ecology. Because although uh, I, I would say that the, the, to the extent that within the, main, the, the profession broadly defined, the sort of respectable profession, not the people really um, on the outside of it like the leftist economists and the Marxian economists and so forth, the heterodox as we call ourselves sometimes, or the political economists, but within respectable opinion, the people who are tenured at the big economics, you know, top economics departments and so forth, there is still a small residue of Keynesian thinking. And it came out right after the, uh, the uh, collapse. And of course, these were the folks like Stiglitz and Blinder and so on and so forth who were arguing for stimulus and big stimulus and standard kinds of Keynesian ideas. But one of the things that that conversation, if you were following it in the months, particularly the six months after the crash, before the mainstream kind of sort of consolidated and, and the more conservative forces in the profession consolidated and started to move the conversation very much away from a kind of Keynesian, in Keynesian conversation, in back to you know much more conservative economic policy, and so we ended up having to talk about deficits and more tax cuts for the rich, and so on and so forth. Um, one of the things about that conversation was its single-minded emphasis on the idea that we have to grow, 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 grow. The stimulus has to get us back to growth because we're going to then get jobs to, which will trickle down from the growth. And in fact, you can say that macroeconomics, even the best of it, which is the Keynesian part of it, is uh, what I would call, it's, an in, it's, a, it's, a, it's a paradigm of indiscriminate growth. It's really not talking about what we need to grow, what, 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 what the planet needs, what our communities need, what people need. It's an idea of, and of course, there's the famous uh, statement about where Keynes said, you know, we could just pay people to fill up empty bottles and bury them in the sand and then, you know, pay them to dig them up again, and that would get the economy going again, which was true. Of course, Keynes was not, uh, Keynes was not advocating paying people to fill up empty bottles. But he, wa he was making a point that you can stimulate an economy by doing stuff which is uh, quite unnecessary. You can also stimulate an economy by uh, building a lot of stuff which is very harmful, and that's what the, the military industrial complex, if to use an old fashioned word, is talking about now as they're facing the possibility of cuts in, in the so called defense budget. They are talking about how important it is to keep spending on defense in order to, uh, because of, of the purported job creation uh, impacts of defense. Well, as it turns out, it's about the worst thing you could spend on if you want to have job creation. But the, the, conversation on, um, the conversation on growth, which was taking place in the fall of 2008, was surreal from both the conservative and the liberals in the economics profession. Why? Because at the same time that that conversation was taking place, we were getting a series of reports and preparatory information from the scientists of the world in the lead up to Copenhagen, which happened in February of 2009. And what the scientists were telling us was that we were on a course of ecocide that the growth of the world economy and the growth of the wealthy economies or the carbon legacy countries, and at that time were also the, you know, and still major carbon emitters, um, 
had to be stopped. And so if you were watching where, with wearing both these hats, which is what I do, watching both the ecological conversation and the economic conversation, it was crazy. It was the scientists telling us we are growing, you know, we are expanding this planet off the cliff, and the macroeconomists were saying, how can we get there faster? <laughs> and it, actually true, I went back, if you look at everything that was written after the downturn, there was virtually nothing from economists about how we need to take this moment to, to green our economy, to change the course of our economy. No, it was just about more growth, more growth, whether we're talking about the liberals, the conservatives. Environmentalists managed to get a lot of good stuff into the stimulus bill, but it was with no help from the economists. So that's the second big point. And this is one that is um, really, I think, all of economics up until the 1970s really was mostly guilty of. You can say Malthus. Malthus obviously had a vision about um, inadequate resources, a bad model, didn't turn out to be right in a lot of ways. I'm not a neo-Malthusian, but I am a person who says that we can no longer treat the environment as if it is an externality. And that's, of course, the language. Any of you who have taken an economics course, you know that's the language which is used to discuss the environment. And it's, a, it's very important, I think, for us to, to ponder that language for a minute, because it actually describes something very real about the way economics as a field has handled the natural environment, which is that it has literally externalized it or banished it. And you can look at all of the top economics departments in the country, and you will not find at any of them more than one person in any of those departments who does, quote unquote, environmental economics, not one. Um, it is a, it's a very, very marginalized subfield. Even Stanford, which has a huge interest as a university in issues of the environment, you know, partly because it has a lot of energy funding, but for other uh, reasons too. Even in that department, they have been, un with the chairman, the one environmental economist in the department, fought and lost on the, on the struggle to get a second person. Now, this is the most important economic, never mind economic problem, problem facing humanity today. The fact that we are on a path of ecocide, that we are on a path of climate destabilization, which we have been unable as a species to stop up to this point, and the economics profession has basically ignored it. And it wasn't until after 2006, probably in 2007, may, maybe by 2008, that the majority of American economists were willing to get behind the idea that the government had to do something significant about climate. And that, we've got to ask the question, why? Where is that blindness from? What is causing it? It's partly analytic, it's partly ideological. So um, I think my time is up. Um, I want to end by saying that um, we need a new economics, not just the economics of Keynes and Marx, which are really crucial and central to the concerns of the Occupy movement, but also an ecological economics. And there is a new movement which has begun uh, pretty much in earnest since the downturn, and it's called New Economics. Um, some of us have been working in it for a lot longer than that. I know there's going to be a conference here at the end of March uh, around New Economics. I don't know if any of the organizers <laughs> of that are here right now. Um, but there are a number of groups which are working on a new economic vision, which takes the two issues that I've talked about today, distribution and environment, but also adds a third, and that is scale. So the new economics is about small scale. It's about relocalization. It's about living in a, a very different kind of way 
in order to um, avoid the kinds of concentrations of power that the one in the 99% uh, have represented, as well as the kind of rapacious relationship between the economy and the planet that, and, and local environments as well that we've gotten from standard uh, 19th century style economics. So um, I welcome uh, any of you to get involved in the variety of new economics groups that are out there. I'm going to mention one or two that you might uh, take a look at um, for some views of, of the um, uh, critical economics um, which you can uh, send around to folks and also for uh, a new statement of economists supporting the Occupy movement, you can go to a, a, a site called econ4.org, and that's Economics for People, Planet and Future. It's a group I'm involved with, e um, started by um, people at the University of Massachusetts, which is a, uh, a kind of heterodox economics department. There's the New Economics Institute, um, is another one, and um, pretty much for most of these, um, we can get to a whole range of other new economics groups that are out there, which include both economists and also people from outside the profession who are eager to try and build a new economy. Thank you.